Uh, so welcome everybody to uh, this session of the University Research Week, where we are celebrating the winners of the Postdoctoral Award for Research Excellence, or the PAR Awards. Uh, my name is Joyce Tan, and I am Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, and I oversee the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs. The, off the Office administers the PAR Awards. The PAR Award is an award given every year to five postdoctoral fellows to recognize excellence of research in a variety of disciplines. And I would just like to call out the names of our winners this year. And I have a slide deck to share here. Um, so our winners are Lee Kerr from the School of Education, Rebecca Krubenovich from the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Zen Yini from the Department of Applied Science, Kai Wang from the Department of Ophthalmology, and Jessica Young from the Department of Epidemiology and the Shep Center for Health Services Research. So congratulations to our very deserving postdocs. Okay, now I would like to um, introduce our moderator today, who is Mark Heise. Mark is a professor in the Department of Genetics in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Mark has been a partner uh, with the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs as a faculty mentor for the, for the past several years, he, where he provides postdoctoral guidance and mentorship on behalf of the office. He is also the faculty point of contact for the PAR Awards. Uh, Mark will be moderating the presentations today. Mark, I'll pass things over to you. Thank you, Joyce. It's a pleasure to be here and a real honor to be able to uh, introduce uh, this year's uh, winners uh, in terms of their presentation. Our first presenter today uh, will be uh, Lee Kerr from the School of Education, uh, who's mentored by uh, Dr. Troy Sadler. And the title of Lee's presentation will be Promoting Scientific Literacy Through Modeling in the Context of Socioscientific Issues. Lee, it is all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Heiser. Um, let me share my screen. And thank you for the Office of Postdoctoral of, uh, Affairs. Um, I'm very honored to receive this award as an education postdoc researcher. So. Um, today I'm going to present a quick five minute overview of my research. Uh, the title of my talk, which happens to be my research focus is promoting scientific literacy through modeling in the context of social scientific issues. Um, I will briefly unpack the three key terms in the title, scientific literacy, modeling, and social scientific issues, and conclude the talk with an example of our current work that uh, has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Scientific literacy has been one of the primary goals uh, for science education reforms and standards for different countries around the world, including the US. According to Robert, uh, the term scientific literacy represents two visions. Vision one tends to prioritize a well-defined body of academic knowledge and practices associated with the discipline of science. That is, achievement of vision one requires that students develop understandings of science content and how science works with an aim to prepare future scientists. On the other hand, vision two highlights scientific knowledge and perspectives relevant in society that go beyond the boundaries of scientific disciplines. Under vision two, the goal is for students to become responsible citizens who can use science and make informed decisions in their lives. Uh, in my research, I strive to promote student scientific literacy that falls under both visions. Um, to promote student disciplinary competencies, I focus on the practice of modeling that scientists often use in their field work. Scientific modeling for scientific models are representations that describe, explain, and predict scientific phenomena or systems. Models can take many forms, such as drawing, computer simulation or mathematical equations with underlying scientific principles. Modeling is the practice of creating, revising, evaluating, and using models. 
modeling as a useful tool for learners to make sense of the natural world and as a key practice identified in the US science standards. To make it relevant to students' daily life, my work examines students' science learning, modeling practice in particular in the context of social scientific issues. Social scientific issues are contentious social issues with conceptual ties to science that include societal influences. Common social scientific issues include climate change, the pandemic, water quality, and so forth. The rationale for social scientific issue-based learning involves one, increased student interest and engagement, two, learning of science content, and three, development of informed decision-making. While modeling and social scientific issue-based learning are traditionally viewed as separate subfields in science education li literature, my work tries to bridge them together. I argue that the integration of modeling and social scientific issues, if enacted synergistically, can advance students' competency in both discipline knowledge and its social implications. Therefore, my research centers around designing and examining learning environments that engage students in modeling practice to understand, negotiate, and resolve complex societal issues. Here's an example of this line of work that has received government fundings. In our current NSF project, we are developing social scientific issue-based curriculum materials for North Carolina secondary students and examining how they use different types of model to learn about viral epidemics. In particular, students are engaged in three types of models. One, diagrammatic models about the mechanism of viral reproduction. Two, computational models, the net logo simulation about viral transmission. And three, system models about the social implication of viral epidemics. With the assumption that all models have limitation and they're always partial in the sense that a single model only represents, explain or predict certain aspects of phenomena or system. We are interested in exploring how all students, including those from culturally and linguistically diverse populations, navigate these three types of models to negotiate and make informed decisions about viral epidemics. To conclude the presentation today, I want to make my acknowledgement with a screenshot. This is a screenshot of our research team working with our collaborating teachers virtually to design social scientific issue-based curriculum materials about COVID-19 when the pandemic first broke out in the US back in the spring of 2020. First, I want to thank my faculty supervisor and mentor, Dr. Troy Sattler, uh, who's on the lower um, right corner here. And Troy has been always encouraging and supportive of my work and professional development as an early career scholar since I joined his lab in 2018, about three years ago. Thank you, Troy. Next. I also want to thank my collaborators, Dr. Uh, Pat Fridgerson and Dr. Laura Zangori at the University of Missouri, who appeared on the upper center of the screenshot. I enjoy work, working and writing paper with them a lot. Last but not least, I want to thank our collaborating teachers as well as uh, all the research team members without whom my research cannot be possibly done. Thank you all very much. That's all for my presentation today. Thank you for your time. Uh, and I'm, I'm ready to take the questions. Thank you, Dr. Curry. That was a very nice and very timely uh, presentation. Um, I, I will invite uh, members of the audience uh, to ask questions via the chat. Uh, I will read them. Uh, I actually neglected to say that at the beginning of the session and I apologize for that. Uh, while we're waiting to see if anybody has any specific questions, uh, Dr. Kerr, Given how timely this topic is, have you run in, have you found uh, more effective mechanisms for really communicating, uh, especially issues around vaccine uptake or uh, around the pandemic? I'm always looking for input and advice on this, so. Um, <clears throat> that's an important question. Uh, well, um, our research is not working on communicating to the like population, but we're focusing on kind of addressing this issue in the school system. Mm -hmm. um, so 
what we have been trying to do now is trying to um, collaboratively design curriculum materials with teachers who are going to teach the unit about the important science aspect of it, but also the social um, implication of that. So we help teachers to feel comfortable kind of addressing this issue in their science classroom um, because we know many science teachers feel like the social implication is not part of science. So it shouldn't be discussed in science classroom. We want to kind of um, help them to review, uh, uh, rethink about what science education is for. So this is an important part of our research efforts. Yeah, I, I, th I, I think that's tremendous. And uh, you know, I wish you the best of luck uh, you. as you go forward with this. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so if not, uh, thank you again uh, for a very nice talk and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next presenter will be Dr. Rebe uh, Rebecca uh, Krepinovich, uh, who has a joint appointment in the Department of Biological and Biomedical Engineering, um, or in the Joint Department, I'm sorry, uh, of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, her mentor is Dr. Jason Franz, um, and the title of her presentation will be Walking with a Flat Tire, The Role of Foot Mechanics in Elderly Gait. Uh, Dr. Krepinovich, uh, it's all yours. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you to the PAR Awards Committee for this award and for the opportunity to talk a bit about my research today. As we age, we start to walk slower and you might be able to picture the slow shuffling steps that are common to many older adults. Well, walking speed or this age-related decline in walking speed is a strong and consistent predictor for adverse health outcomes in older adults. A quick look through this table shows us that as walking speed decreases, older adults are more likely to suffer from falls, hospitalization, and lack of independence in their daily life. As one example of how walking speed can impact independence, let's think for a minute about crosswalks. If you want to safely cross a two lane street, you need to be able to walk at around one meter per second. If you want to safely cross a four lane street, for example, Franklin Street, you need to be able to walk at over 1.3 meters per second, which might be challenging and prohibitive for many older adults. But what causes these declines in mobility with age? Well, my research aims to answer this question by exploring how our muscles and tendons work together to power human locomotion, and specifically how these muscle tendon interactions change with age. <clears throat> From a biomechanical perspective, one of the most consistent characteristics of older adult gait is a reduction in push-off intensity or power during the part of walking when your foot is pushing off the ground. This reduction in push-off power is often attributed to weaker calf muscles. And we can see in the figure on the right that older adults, sorry, that's the left, older adults have a smaller ankle contribution to push-off work. Um, unfortunately, interventions designed to strengthen the calf muscles while they may be effective at increasing strength, have been unsuccessful at improving push-off intensity, uh, which suggests that these age-related declines in calf muscle strength are probably not the only contributing factor to reduce push-off intensity during walking. So moving just a bit past the ankle, we know that the foot plays a really big role in governing push-off power during walking. The structures of the foot, such as the plantar fascia, which is an elastic structure that spans the bottom of your foot, and the foot's intrinsic muscles, they allow the foot to function as both a stiff lever for push off and an elastic energy storage and return system like a rubber band. In the figures on the right, I wanna call your attention to the highlighted portion of these two crafts that show foot and ankle power during walking. We can see that the foot on the bottom functions in a very similar way as the ankle on the top during this push off phase of walking, which indicates that it has an important role in generating propulsive power. Now, this is particularly important in the context of aging because older adults display reduced foot stiffness, which may disrupt the push-off function of the foot. In other words, older adults may be walking around with a flat tire. In a recent paper, we looked at the amount of positive and negative work done by the foot when walking at different speeds. And we can think of work as the amount of effort by the muscles across the entire step. 
we showed that not only do older adults in blue exhibit less positive footwork than young adults, they also exhibit more negative footwork than young adults, um, resulting in an overall loss of energy from the foot. Now this age-related loss of energy actually got worse as walking speed increased, which may act to limit walking speed in older adults um, or limit you know, the, the maximum ability of older adults, for example, when crossing a crosswalk. In my ongoing research, we're exploring the mechanisms underlying these age-related reductions in foot power. We use ultrasound imaging to understand the interaction between the structures of the foot and ankle. Our data show that foot mobility and foot stiffness directly affect calf muscle behavior, which supports recent evidence suggesting that a structural connection exists between the Achilles tendon and plantar fascia. Um, and this is important because it transmits force from the foot to the ankle. Now, in aging, we have preliminary images from young and older adults to suggest that this structural connection actually recedes with age. And we can see that in the representative images of an older adult on the left and a young adult on the right, which may have really important implications for reduced force transmission between these two structures in older adults. In summary, age-related differences in foot structure and function may manifest as reduced push-off intensity in older adults. And the findings of my research and where I hope to, to go with this research um, lies in the translational implications that it has for the design and development of mobility interventions and assistive devices geared towards maintaining walking ability in our older adult population. I want to quickly acknowledge my lab mates in the Applied Biomechanics Lab, my funding sources and our collaborators, and I'm happy to take any questions. Very nice presentation. Uh, again, just a reminder to everybody, uh, if you do have questions, uh, please use the chat and I will read them out. Um, so I guess, uh, again, I will start. Um, so I'm assuming that even amongst older populations, there's a lot of variation in terms of uh, propulsive force coming out from the foot. Have you looked at all in terms of individuals that maintain uh, high function uh, into advanced age, do, are there factors that stand out in those individuals? Um, I haven't looked specifically at foot propulsive force in mm -hmm. highly functioning older adults, um, but we do know that, so uh, as part of my, my dissertation research, I um, looked at master's runners, so older adult runners who've been running for 30 or more years, um, and, you know, really fit, really highly, um, you know, in the peak of their health. And if they actually walked very similarly to you know, averagely active older adults. So we know that there must be something going on with the way these structures are interacting um, because you know, we've got this group of really active and strong older adults versus you know, a group of average older adults. And we would expect to see some sort of uh, benefit during walking from, from those years of activity, but we typically don't. That's really interesting. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I will ask, do we have any, Jennifer? Um, so Jennifer, I can't see them. Um, so I may need you to read those questions. Out. So the question that came in, does the physical weakening of the connection between the Achilles tendon and plantar fascist with age have other adverse impacts on the um, physiology of the foot besides decreasing push-off strength? Um, that's a great question. And my answer is gonna be mostly a guess um, because this is a, sort of a new area for us looking at this connection and the, the impact of this connection. Um, but I can imagine that it would uh, stiffen the foot um, you know, since you're losing that elastic connection between the foot and ankle, you're, you're going to have less of a range of motion um, at the heel. And so you're going to have a more stiff foot, you know, with the bones of the foot. They're not going to be able to move in perhaps the way that they should be able to. So I will ask one more question. Um, so how much of the effect it goes beyond uh, pure structural effects and moving 
function, uh, so does proprioception or anything else affect uh, push-off strength, or is it, do you believe it's mostly a structural issue? That's a great question because um, you know walking biomechanics it, it's a very multifactorial issue. You know the, there's things such as you know psychological fear of falling in older adults or tactile, like you said, sort of proprioceptive. Um, you know maybe they don't have as much feeling on the bottom of their foot. And so they're not really sure where they're putting their foot. Um, and so there, a lot of these things can contribute to differences in um, walking mechanics in young and older adults. Um, but that's why we like looking at the, the muscles and tendons because being able to really see um, how the muscles and tendons are working differently in these two populations gives us an idea of um, sort of the, the structural components, the structural effects. Mm -hmm. Great, that's great. Well. Uh, thank you again, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter uh, will be Dr. Uh, Zenyu Ni uh, from the Department of Applied Physical Sciences. Uh, 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 Dr. Ni's mentor is uh, Jin Song Wong, and the title of Dr. Ni's presentation is Sex and Perscovites for More Efficient Perscovite Solar Cells. And Dr. Ni, you are on. Okay, okay. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about our uh, recent study on the uh, effects in prescribed to make a prescribed solar cell more efficient. Solar energy has now become one of the most important and, and the economic sources for the power generation around the world. And uh, as a clean and renewable energy source, solar energy is important for the realization of net zero carbon dioxide emission by 2030 or 2050. And also among all the renewable energy sources, uh, solar is now becoming one of the cheapest way to add new electricity uh, to the uh, current uh, power grid. And uh, uh, as proposed by the uh, US Department of Energy by 20, 2035, the solar energy has the potential to power 40% of the nation's electricity. So to convert the uh, solar energy to electricity, we need a solar cell. A solar cell is a device that contain uh, light absorbing material, which can generate the electron and the host after absorbing the sunlight. And also with an appropriate device structure, the photo generated electron and the host can be separated and extracted to external circuit. And uh, the key merit of a solar cell is evaluated by the uh, parameter named the power conversion efficiency, which is the ratio between the output electrical energy and the input solar energy of a, a solar cell. So of course, we need a high PCE uh, for the solar cells. Well, in our lab, uh, we mainly focus on the perovskite solar cell. And uh, what's the advantage of the perovskite solar cell? Uh, number one, they are very cheap. Uh, the, the raw material and the fabrication process of a perovskite solar cell are much cheaper than the uh, current uh, commercialized uh, silicon solar cells. And also, uh, they are flexible. Not only mean they, uh, they can be uh, fabricated on the flexible substrate, but also mean that uh, the fabrication process are quite flexible. Uh, here's a, a video shows how we uh, fabricated the perovskite uh, uh, thin film on uh, flexible uh, substrates using the loadable coding method in our lab. You can see it takes only a few seconds to fabricate a large error uh, perovskite film. Another advantage is that the perovskite solar cell has ultra high solar cell efficiency. So we can see uh, in the past 10 years, the PCE of uh, Proskite solar cell has uh, uh, boosted from about 10% to over 25%, which are now uh, one of the best performing solar cells. However, there is, uh, there are, there is uh, still a room to uh, further improve the PCE of proskite solar cell to reach their theoretical limitation. And uh, reducing this gap is one of the most important tasks uh, for the solar cell community today. And uh, uh, this gap is mainly due to the presence of the traps in perovskite solar cell. If the photo generated uh, electron or holes are trapped by a trap space in the uh, solar cell, they cannot be uh, used for the generation of electricity anymore. So uh, this process can be understood by using uh, this analogical uh, device structure for solar cell. The water tank, uh, the water in the tank uh, uh, represents the voltage potential of a, a solar cell. If there are holes in the tank, uh, the water will leak from the tank and the total water pressure will be reduced. So uh, this is how the traps in a solar cell would uh, cause the 
the recombination loss of carrier and reduce the PCE. So to address this issue, the very first question is, uh, where are the traps in perspective solar cell? And uh, this has been a long, uh, a great uh, a challenge uh, for the solar cell society. So uh, in this work, uh, we first use a method named uh, drive level capacitance pro profiling to study the spatial and the energetic distributions of the traps in perspective solar cell. And then we pointed out how this chop distribution and the chop density would influence the solar cell efficiency. So uh, in principle, uh, the drive level, drive level capacitance profiling um, is also a junction capacitance measurement based technique. Uh, it can measure the chop distribution in both space and uh, energy depths in, uh, for the typical prospect uh, solar cell using a changing AC and the DC valves. So uh, using this method, we first studied the chop density and the distributions in a uh, Mesalinium that add a single crystal uh, solar cell. We found that uh, the single crystal, uh, uh, the first uh, single crystal had a very low bubble trap density of about 10 to the power of 11 per cubic centimeter, while the interface has a higher trap density than the bulk. And also, uh, in the mesalinium that add a single crystal solar cell, uh, we found that uh, most of the uh, deep traps are located at the interface between the perskite and the transport layer PDA. And uh, while the, the shallow traps uh, are more uniformly distributed throughout, throughout the, uh, the crystal. So uh, this highlights the importance of optimizing this interface to reduce the deep traps. And also uh, they can use this method to uh, get the spatial and energetic distributions of traps in uh, high performance uh, first get simple solar cells, which has a PCE of uh, 21 cent. We found that uh, for both the deep and the shallow traps, the chopper density at the interface are much higher than that inside the film. So uh, this indicates that uh, more attention needed to be paid to optimize the processing film solar cells by reducing the traps at these uh, interfacial regions. And also we found that uh, uh, the chopper density at the bottom interface of the process solar cells, which is the process and the PDA interface has higher, uh, is higher than that of the top interface. The reason is that uh, uh, there are existing many uh, crystalline perskite structure uh, at this interface which has different structural orientation with the bulk perskite. And this uh, now crystal uh, structure contributed to the uh, deeper traps here and uh, reduce the PCE. So if we can uh, further reduce both the interface and the uh, bulk trap density in the perskite cell, uh, the, uh, the PCE of the perskite solar cell can be significantly in, uh, improved and uh, become uh, close to the theoretical limitation. So uh, further efforts are highly needed to uh, further reduce the traps and our work pointed out uh, where should it be adjusted. So uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank the, our uh, collaborators and also the funding agency and also Professor uh, Ping Song Fang uh, for uh, supervising this project and uh, the group members who also contributed to uh, this project. And also uh, thank you for the listening and I will uh, take your question. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. So I'm going to open up to any questions in the um, uh, question and answer. Um, if not, I guess I'd like to uh, just ask, you know, given uh, how quickly the field is moving, what sort of time frame do you see in terms of your work uh, translating directly towards uh, more commercial applications. Do you see a, a rapid transition or is your work going to, is there still a lot of work that needs to be done? Yeah, uh, I should say there, uh, there still need, a, there are uh, still uh, a lot of work needed to be done uh, to translate our, what we have done in the lab now and for the practical use, practical use of uh, the Prescott uh, solar cell in the real applications. Uh, one thing is about the uh, stability issue. Still, uh, although many uh, Prescott solar cell has, uh, has uh, quite a good stability, which can pass uh, uh, like four, four thousands uh, uh, stability test, but uh, uh, they have not been fully uh, proved in their uh, practical use as compared to their, uh, the current commercialized silicon solar cells. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions. 
and other questions. So uh, keep up the good work and congratulations. Thank you. All right, so our next presentation will be by Dr. Tai Wang Wong from the Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, uh, Dr. Wong's mentor is uh, Dong Zhao Han, and uh, Dr. Wong's uh, presentation is titled Deliver Therapeutics to Fight Vision Loss in Cancer. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Mark. And thanks for so much for recognizing this in my research. I'm Kai Wang, uh, a postdoc at Dr. Hans Lab in the Department of Ophthalmology. I'm currently working on the delivering therapeutics to treat vision loss and cancers. Uh, let me tell you some facts first regarding the surveys. People feel more, uh, vision loss more than death and other diseases. Hence, to keep this clear vision, could be one of the most critical issues in healthcare. However, there are over 1 million people blind and over 3 million vision impairment patients in the US, according to CDC. And unfortunately, this many of this disease doesn't have this approved treatment, which means that, uh, that there's no way to save their vision. The surgeries of the ocular cancer may also cause a loss of vision. The reason for the circulation is quite complex, and there's a little specificity to the disease pathology. Uh, the delivery through the traditional eye drops could be very low efficient, and there's a limited availability of the current drug. To fight with the vision loss isn't that easy because we are lacking weapons as before. It's my job to establish an arsenal. I mean, with the, the newly uh, medicines and the genetic medicines so to fight with the, this disease. First of all, so I'm so targeting as the treatment of the age related macular degeneration. This is a, a disease so is the leading cause of blindness in senior person. And most of them so, uh, are dreadful, which means that uh, they don't have this uh, blood. So, uh, and uh, this uh, disease uh, has uh, many risk factors. All those factors uh, are related to the oxidative stress. So I'm targeting the to neutralizing the oxidative stress to give this skill. But uh, a long-term antioxidant, uh, long antioxidants could be the preferred as a treatment. So I choose uh, the, this is, uh, uh, the serum oxide, which is self-regenerating and work for a very long time. But this one is less water soluble. So in this case, I divide with the nature polymer, the base the hydrogel as a delivery vehicle for this as a nanomedicine. Uh, this, will, uh, this way will make it easier to, to deliver the, through the eye and the sustained is uh, released. We have to uh, perform the studies uh, of the, the, the injectable hydrogel encapsulated the nanomedicines uh, in the cell and on mice. This is helps us uh, neutralize the oxidative stress and uh, uh, protects the cell from the cell death. And uh, uh, the nanomedicines could also save the retinal structures and the animal vision in the animal study. This has a potential to be the dry AMD treatment. And I did not just only work on the elderly people's disease, but also worked on the pediatric cancers, retinoblastoma. This cancer causes death and the vision loss after the surgery. I also performed the immunotherapy on these cancers. So I use the CAR T technologies. This, uh, this uh, technology engineers the T cells and uh, uh, target uh, for the liquid tumors perversely, but it's pretty hard to use on the solid tumors because of all the blood tumors barriers and the low migration rates, something like that. So I'm still using the hydrogel as a delivery vehicle to treat the, this is a cancer. You see here, uh, we 
has uh, performed the subretinal injections uh, on the uh, patients of the retinal blastoma. And uh, without uh, with hydrogen gel uh, uh, encapsulations, uh, it uh, breaks uh, blood, barrier, uh, blood uh, tumor barriers and uh, releases the T cells to a limited tumor. And uh, then it completely uh, prevents the recurrence of the tumor. And uh, uh, with uh, using on the T cells, uh, the tumor uh, still there. This method also uh, protects uh, the, uh, the patients or the, the uh, animal models uh, uh, in here. It protects the retina the structure and the patients as we started. This method is, is clinical ready, and uh, some people that are contacting us for the, the free, uh, future clinical trial. Last but not least, uh, I'm also so working on to uh, working on this optimizing the gene delivery vehicle which could uh, treat the um, inherited eye uh, disease and others as uh, inherited disease so i use this as uh, adenal associated viruses as uh, vectors this has been uh, approved by fda and uh, which makes the some that uh, inherited disease as uh, treatable however since most patients has uh, suffered from the uh, pre-existing uh, immune response. And this is also in the eyes, which reduces the gene therapy effect. So I'm also uh, I'm trying to use the uh, polymer to optimize uh, this uh, vector to let it uh, to react to form the nanoparticle. So this nanoparticle will uh, avoid the, uh, interacting with the nutrients and antibodies so in this case and uh, which will also reduce the cellular response in the uh, cell and the animal models. So with the, the, this technology, so we improve the, the transduction efficiencies of the, the vectors, both on the cells and the animals. And uh, this is a method to solve the, the immunity problems, better serves as the gene therapies, uh, both in the eye and other tissues. Eventually, this will also cure the disease, uh, which is a, uh, this will also cure the genetic disease, which is a, a not a considered to be the treatable before. Uh, that's uh, all I have done uh, during my uh, post -up. That's uh, uh, quite a few things, uh, but I don't have much time to uh, share them in detail. In the last, I would thank uh, my PI, Dr. Han, and uh, for the support and the guidance. And the uh, colleagues, uh, Mitra and uh, Sue, and the seminars uh, with the help, and uh, our uh, collaborators, peers, uh, my uh, funding source. Thank you so much for the listening. Very nice. Um, so it looks like we um, do have one question, um, in, uh, which is uh, are there potential downsides to the use of hydrogel as a delivery agent in the eye? That's a very, very good question. Uh, that could be the reason that uh, no hydrogel has been approved as the delivery vehicle in the eye because it may meet some uh, drawback, like the degradation issues and uh, in the processing, it may meet some uh, residual which could be harmful for the eye. But the uh, desirable hydrogen gel should be the biocompatible and uh, should be non toxic, and the degradation the products uh, could be the absorbed by the eye. So that could be the most desirable. That's also so what I'm planning to do in the future time to the, make it the hydrogen gel the ideal for the, the, the drug deliveries for the eye. Great. Um, I have one other question. Uh, so I've always thought of the eye as an immune privilege site. Um, so does that raise, now that may be out of date, but uh, does that cause any problems in terms of your retinoblastoma treatments for additional challenges in terms of? Uh, uh, I would say that your knowledge is still up to date uh, and the uh, immune privilege only is, uh, includes the retina part, but uh, any space and the retina, all 
within retina, it's a general privilege since it's a no T cells and the neutrons and antibody will get in there. But unfortunately, it's, it's, uh, the injections through the subretinas could be very harmful. And uh, if you use injections through the vitreous, that could be easier. And that is the other patient the injection. But if you use injecting AV through the uh, vitreous, this is still less effective compared to the injecting the subretinal space. That's what I mentioned. That's what I have to solve in future for the AV project. But for the treatment, the treatment of the retinal blastoma, I think that it's better to perform the intravitreal injection. So we are hoping that we can get some funds that could perform uh, some intravitreal uh, performance, uh, intravitreal injections of the, the CAR T cells in clinic as a um, clinical trial to see the, the safety. But definitely the intravitreal this could be the more preferred than subretina. Great, thank you. Thank um, you. Well, again, a nice presentation, very nice research, and congratulations uh, on your work. All right, so our next presenter will be uh, Dr. Jessica Young, uh, who's in the Cecil B. G. Shep Center for Health Services Research. Uh, Dr. Young's uh, mentor is Dr. Till Sturmer, and uh, the title of her presentation is Opioid Prescription Limits, Balancing Risk with relief. All yours, Dr. Young. Great. Thank you. Um, I assume you can all see my slides. Okay. Uh, well, thank you to the PAR committee. I'm very honored to be here today and I'll be sharing some of my research evaluating opioid prescription limits. I uh, listed relevant funding, but I have no conflicts of interest to report. Um, so opioids play a really important role in the management of post-surgical pain. Um, prolonged opioid use after surgery has also been reported to be the most common post-surgical complication. So a central clinical challenge for opioid prescribing is striking a balance between safe and adequate pain management. In response to the U.S. opioid crisis, opioid prescription limits have been implemented on a state-by-state -state basis. And the exact policies vary state by state, but the most common policy we see is a seven day supply limit. But overall, there's very little evidence of supporting um, like what these cutoffs are and um, how effective these limits are. So the objective for this research um, was twofold. The first was to examine the risk of prolonged opioid use associated with varying initial number of days supply of an opioid. And the second was to evaluate the impact of different hypothetical prescribing limits on prolonged opioid use. So for this work, we used Medicare claims data and we identified patients undergoing invasive surgery. We focused on the day supply of that first opioid prescription somebody receives for a post-op pain. And we examined the risk of prolonged opioid use, which we measured in the 90 days after surgery. We collected information, um, all sorts of information ranging from demographics, surgical characteristics, what their actual procedure was, and different baseline health indicators before surgery. And we estimated the risk of prolonged opioid use associated with different values of initial number of days supplied. Um, our second objective was then to estimate the impact of varying prescribing limits and we did this based on the nine most common values of the initial day supply. So overall, we identified uh, just over 1 million surgical patients who met our inclusion criteria, and about 70% of these patients received a perioperative opioid prescription for their postoperative pain. The most common initial prescription was a five-day supply. And um, for your reference, the most common procedures we see in this population were knee arthroplasty, hernia repair, laparoscopic colectectomy, and knee arthroscopy. 
So again, our first objective examined how risk of prolonged opioid use changed with the initial number of days supplied. And here on that x-axis, I've plotted the initial number of days supplied of an opioid prescription. And on the y-axis, I have plotted the risk of prolonged opioid use per thousand surgeries. So we can see pretty clearly we have a monotonic increase from about four per thousand in patients with no perioperative opioid to 44 per thousand in those initially receiving 15 or more days. After adjusting for baseline factors, we continue to see a monotonic increase, but the trend is attenuated as shown here in orange. So some key takeaways from this first objective. We saw that the risk of prolonged use increased with higher initial day supply, but it's also important to keep in mind that we see that the risk is attenuated after adjustment. So this suggests that much of the observed increase in risk is likely related to the types of patients who receive longer prescriptions rather than that prescription duration itself. So moving on to the second objective, we next examine the impacts of different prescribing limits based on day supply. So here I have nine rows in this table, one for each hypothetical prescription limit that we evaluated. And again, these were chosen because these are the nine most common values we see in the data for initial number of days supplied. And we have a lot of numbers in this table, so I'll just highlight a few. And I'm starting with this four day supply limit, which um, this is where we saw the largest risk difference. So when we look at this four day supply limit, we see that this limit would impact about 63% of surgical patients. So that means that 466,960 patients received an opioid prescription for post-surgical pain that exceeded four days. So the day supply was five or more. Um, and if a four day limit had been in place, we assume that those patients would have instead received a four-day prescription because by law, that's the maximum in this hypothetical scenario. Um, so we estimate the risk of prolonged opioid use for these patients would be reduced from 24.4 per thousand to 19.6 per thousand. And what that translates to is that overall, 2,255 cases of prolonged opioid use would be avoided. So in this case, with a four-day supply limit, we impact the care for almost 467,000 patients, and we end up avoiding just over 2,000 cases of prolonged opioid use. So the most common limit we see across the states continues to be a seven-day supply limit. And when we look at the results here, we see that this limit would impact about 167,000 patients or just, um, just around a quarter of all surgeries and would result in an estimated 341 fewer cases of prolonged opioid use. So some key takeaways here, we see that much of the observed increase, um, oh, sorry. So for, for the key takeaways here, we see that the limits may impact a lot of patients while averting relatively few cases of prolonged opioid use. Um, furthermore, we see that the common seven-day supply limit was associated with a relatively small reduction in risk. Um, and it's very likely that procedure-specific guidelines are more appropriate for clinical care than these all-encompassing prescription limits. Um, so I'll end with a little bit of public health impact. While concerns of excess, ex excess supply and addiction following surgery has prompted a lot of states to set prescribing limits, these attempts to regulate opioid prescribing can pose clinical challenges. Um, they, they really limit the opportunity to integrate individual assessment, pain severity, and other clinical factors that physicians would typically use in their decision-making process. Uh, we found that the current, currently implemented prescribing limits may actually have a really large um, impact on clinical care, but a somewhat limited impact on reducing prolonged opioid use. So again, we, we, we think it's probably helpful to think more in terms of these procedure-specific guidelines um, 
that may be more helpful. So I, I'd like to thank my mentor um, for my postdoc experience, Till Stermer, uh, along with some co-authors that um, contributed to this work, which is um, going to be published in medical care, um, as well as the AHRQ NURSA Fellows at the SHEP Center and the UNC Pharmaco Epidemiology Group. And I, I welcome any questions. Okay, uh, very nice presentation. So we have uh, one question uh, in the uh, chat. Um, uh, actually, it's a two part question. So I'll start with the first part. How do you define opioid uh, naive in the study? Uh, yeah, that is a good question that I, I think I glossed over the five minutes, um, but I think I have a, so we used um, a 182 day baseline period before the surgery, and it's a little bit complicated. Um, a lot of times when we define opioid naive, we say you didn't have any opioids prior to the surgery, but we did allow, as you can see in this um, diagram, one opioid prescription in the two weeks prior to surgery because we talked to a clinical collaborator at UNC and she had said that occasionally, at least um, in the earlier years of our study, um, people would occasionally fill a prescription right before surgery just so that they have it ready after surgery. So really what we did is um, in the 182 days up to 14 days before the surgery, you couldn't have any prescriptions for opioids. And if you had any prescriptions prior to, in the two weeks prior to surgery, um, if you only had one, we assumed that was for post-operative pain. Okay. Um, and then the second uh, part of the question, which is also from uh, Don Hobart, is what types of patients, uh, what are the types of patients that lead to increased risk of prolonged use? So using all of your other criteria, that you uh, use to uh, normalize? Were there uh, specific traits that stood out? Yeah, that's a good question that I've been asked before. So I, um, in, in the process of submitting this to a journal, that, that came up. So we, we looked into this a little bit as a post hoc analysis. Um, and we looked at just different predictors that were associated with prolonged opioid use. And um, this is just a predictive model, so we're not we can't really say any cause and effect here. Um, but in, in our study population, we saw that um, somewhat in a, this is kind of a nice trend for us to see when we look at the year of surgery, we see that patients who were undergoing surgery earlier um, in the study period were more likely to have prolonged opioid use. So I think that's related to a lot of the increased caution around opioid prescribing um, and just increased awareness. Um, in the more recent years. Um, we also see that um, patients with certain baseline health diagnoses were more likely to have prolonged opioid use. So that includes um, diagnoses for tobacco use disorder, acute pain, chronic back pain. Um, COPD, which we sometimes use as a marker for smoking, um, and those with arthritis um, and with prior use of some prescription anticonvulsants, benzodiazepines, NSAIDs, SSRIs. Um, so those were the main ones that, um, that stood out. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, so, oh, sorry. There's one more question here. Um, also uh, from Dr. Hobart. Uh, oh, that's a comment. Just saying uh, thank you for answering the questions. And really interesting findings. Uh, and I agree with that. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, and uh, again, congratulations both on all the nice work and uh, for receiving uh, the award. And with that, uh, we actually have uh, come to the end of the presentations. And I do just want to take uh, the time to thank all of this year's award winners, uh, both for giving a wonderful presentation, but also for all the work you've done uh, during your time here at UNC. 
And um, one of the things that I really enjoy about this award process is that it really is an opportunity uh, to really highlight the high quality and just the breadth of uh, high quality research that happens here at UNC. And uh, I really appreciate uh, all of you coming today and really, again, demonstrating just what an outstanding place UNC is to do research and how you've all really uh, just exemplified uh, that high quality uh, research. Uh, with that, I will also thank uh, uh, Jennifer Pruitt for all the work that she put in in uh, helping organize today's uh, presentations and also running uh, the award selection process itself and doing a lot of the background work. Uh, uh, Dr. Tan for uh, also introducing the whole program and uh, kicking things off. And I would like to thank the audience for uh, taking the time uh, to attend today. And I'm hopeful that maybe next year we can do this all in person rather than doing it online. So uh, with that, I will thank you all once again, congratulate this year's winners and uh, uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you.